I mean, Alan makes movies. I started writing books and worked in the theater. You worked in the theater. I started making films. Uh, lately, I've stopped making films because it's too difficult. Um, but it's uh, the word of change is bewildering, I would call it, you know, to somebody. I'm 60, what, I'm 65 years old. How old are you? Wow. 50, okay, sorry, I'm 65, I'm old. But, uh, I mean, the speed of change and consumption and the uh, issues that come up in the business that I thought I was in, which was the film business of making films, which I got known for and you got known for, you know, uh, it's extraordinary now to uh, try and finance a movie in the way that I financed a movie like The Crying Game or like Mona Lisa or like Michael Collins even, or like, you know, and... Uh, the last time I had a conversation with, a finan with, with one of these foreign sales agents about a movie, they were talking about a world in which Spain, the territory of Spain, is worth nothing. Yeah, zero. <laughs> yeah. And you go, okay. You know, you used to sell, like, your movie in Spain, the advance would be, what, $6 million or $10 million or whatever, and, so, and they say, Spain, nothing. Okay, good, good. But there still are distributors in Spain who will give you nothing, you know? So I don't know what that means. But it's, uh, it's a different world. It changes so rapidly. And personally speaking, lately, I've just gone back to writing books because that's what I used to do. And it was a lovely thing to do when I did it. I never expected to be paid anything for doing it. I never was paid anything for doing it. And now I'm going back to writing books when I still won't be paid anything for doing it. So it's a rather wonderful thing to do. Neil, I so can't. Hmm? You know, when I hear you throw out, I've stopped making films. I've kind oh, no, I will make some more it's in the future. But at the moment, it's so confusing yeah, yeah. that I just, it's, it's so exhausting to think about it. Yeah. You know, you talk to your kids, say, let's go to see the, let's go to cinema. They say, no, I don't want to, you know. And you try to, you try to buy an innovative movie from iTunes. It says, you pay for it. They say, oh, you'll receive it in two days. You say to your kid, can you get me that? He says, yeah, 10 minutes, okay, but it's illegal. Yeah, yeah. So it's like the innovation that has happened through the way in which people consume the stuff we do by ordinary people and kids, mainly kids, is extraordinary, but the way that the major companies have reacted to that innovation is equally extraordinary mm. and kind of scholaric and lethargic, and it's led to a crisis in what I do, maybe not what you do. But well, I'm still living in hope, probably. Uh, yeah. So do you think the sort of films that you've made over the years, do you think, do you think they're gone to us? Uh, yeah, I think they are, actually. I think it's gone. A bit like Newsweek, that lady said, Newsweek is gone. You know, and I think it's actually, I mean, maybe it might be a refreshing thing to say, okay, the kind of film that, like Taxi Driver or like All the President's Men or that kind of mid-range movie hmm. that existed between the Euro European art movie and the huge blockbuster has actually vanished from the planet, you know? And the really interesting movies now are the tiny little ones that show in, in uh, you know, these little festivals all over the world. Hmm. I suppose the paradigm for, the, for it is Sundance, isn't it, you know? Hmm. You know, and the huge superhero things, I'm sure they're good, but I don't want to see them, nor do I want to make them. Yeah, do you? Yeah, yeah well, I'm open to offers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just, I mean, I was thinking earlier about the extraordinary data that Sunil presented earlier this morning and the, the export figures for American films and, and, and TV, which is extraordinary. Uh, and I suppose, you know, Philip King was mentioning earlier getting his first cowboy hat at the age of seven or something. You know, we've all grown up in that kind of strange culture where there was an osmosis between Ireland and the States, you know? Mm. And, and it's often debated as to whether that was good or bad. How do you see that, like, looking back in your own career? Oh, the, uh, you mean, you mean the, the American relationship influence. between Ireland and America? Yeah. Oh, America was always a savior, yeah. totally. Yeah, yeah, it was always like a, the land of where people just didn't care who you were. Mm. They saw a little thing you did, they said, what, this is wonderful, why can't we do this? It was always that way to me, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I was never a particularly kind of, but the minute, the minute I went there and began to work there, I thought, this is an extraordinary place, why isn't Ireland like that, you know, yeah. and maybe Ireland's becoming like that. But what upsets me a bit about some of the conversations is the word monetize, because you're not meant to monetize culture, you know, it's meant to be worth nothing and everything, isn't it? It's meant to be kind of valueless in a way. And <coughs> sometimes I don't understand these endeavors, you know, saying how do we somehow make money out of what we naturally do, you know? What we naturally do should give us joy, shouldn't it? And should mm. give us something called beauty, you know? But it, should it be monetized? I'm not sure, you know? That's why at the moment, 
when I'm writing a piece of fiction, I find it rather re refreshing and totally liberating because sure. you know one has no expectations yeah, yeah. other than it will be good. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah sure. And even if nobody in the world reads it, still it might be possibly as good as some of the great things you read yeah. in the past, you know? Yeah, yeah. Or you made in the past. You know? But at least you can do that at home, you know, whereas if you're in the real world of you know, making films or popular music, you know, I think what people are saying today is that that's defined by the box office or what it's going to make or what well, they I'm can not, predict. Well, I'm not sure it is on the, on, on, the, on the really low independent level, you know, on the, yeah. uh, you know, you look at, um, you look at some of the films that go through F Sundance and some of the films that do end up exciting the younger kind of segments of the audience who do consume them on YouTube and the various sites that they do. Some of those are made with utter freedom, quite liberating yeah, freedom, yeah. you know, but some of them are also made very, very badly. <laughs> You know, in terms of technical kind of sure. what I would call technical accomplishment. You know what I mean? But yeah, yeah. There's a liberation about the uh, you were saying the absence of expectation for 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 really for really low you know yeah. cheap work. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I think yeah. that's where the exciting stuff is happening. But you were mm. saying that some of those films, you know, and they're extraordinary films, never see the light of day anywhere except perhaps online. Well, that's the problem, isn't it? In a way, yeah. yeah I mean, I'm a, you remember the European Film, film Academy? Yeah. I'm a member of the. Academy of the Motion Pictures, you know, the Oscars Academies, and every year you get, I probably receive 600 movies, you know, yeah. as DVDs, yeah, just so w we can judge them and vote on them and for the various things, and that, you, you just wonder, there is so much being made, you know, and yeah. so little being seen. Often brilliant. It's extraordinary, yeah. and it's a little bit sad, but then, you know, time will sort it out, won't it? So are we getting very pessimistic? Me? No, I'm not pessimistic at all. I mean, I, 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 I love, I just feel incredibly lucky to have begun making movies around 1982, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there was a period there where it seemed you could do anything, you know. One would write a script and six months later you'd be shooting with extraordinary actors and with yeah. a budget. It was a world of creativity and kind of glamour and it was a world I never thought I would actually ever have access to. But that, that world mm. just seems to have vanished, mm. like the snows of last year. <laughs> You know, you mentioned earlier, you know, I think, I think when we were growing up, America was this kind of fantasy, kind of this, yeah. I, I had these American cousins that used to come back every summer from Detroit, and they always just seemed amazing. Like, they had really shiny, clean runners that were white always. But, you know, you were saying that probably that's changed. You know, I, I was in New York last week, and I, I remember that if you went to New York in the 80s, people would say, well, you bring back stuff, mm. you know, because there's something you can't get. Uh, whereas now, you know, we can get everything, you know, the old cliche, we live in a global economy. Mm. Uh, so maybe the, the world of Ireland and the world of America isn't as, uh, as, as perhaps separated as it might have been in the past, even though there were always these powerful cultural links that we celebrate. Uh, do you think this, I mean, we, we love to talk about being Irish. I love to talk about being Irish. I love being Irish, you know, and love mm. talking about Irish culture. But uh, it's interesting, I've just come back from Canada in the last three months doing a film, and mm. no Irish dimension at all, and it was, mm. it was kind of strangely liberating. Mm. Uh, do you think that divide that we've touched on a bit this morning, you know, about Ireland, America, Irish culture, America, I mean, do you think actually those kind of national divides are becoming less important? No, no, I think people are always, places are always defined by what they are, you know. And I personally think Ireland has always been and always will be defined by writing, you know, always. Yeah. And that's what people think of Ireland as. And those who created that culture that has kind of such international kind of recognition factor and import and all that, mm. they did it without expectation. They did it yeah. because that's Ireland. I mean, culturally, I suppose there was, you know, historically there was so little money here. The only thing you could do is write mm. and nobody could stop you doing it, you know. So they did it. Yeah, and yeah. I, I think that's always been, well, to my mind, that's the center of the question. That's what I do as well. So mm. I've got a have a biased attitude on things. I'm sure we're brilliant at farming and I'm sure we're brilliant at innovation and I'm sure we've got great innovators and tech innovators and all that sort of stuff. But yeah. I, mean, I think the culture has always been defined by what it dreams and what it, you know, what it puts down on paper. Mm. I mean, I totally, totally agree with you. And I love being part of that culture. Yeah, and, and likewise, and I, I often say it, but often as I'm saying this, and I think with a little bit of, uh, uh, rebellion in the audience earlier, I think. You know, I often, even as I'm saying it myself, wonder, 
am I just, you know, this cliche of us being a great creative people, an imaginative people, a land of saints and scholars, are we actually starting to believe our own propaganda? Well, there's nothing wrong with that, is there? It's better than <laughs> thinking you're crap all the time, <laughs> which is what we used to do when I was a kid, you know? But it's, I mean, it's good that you believe in yourself, isn't it? It's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. And you see kids today, they don't have that beaten down as, as uh, uh, Joseph O'Connor said, they don't have that beaten down thing, which actually is, is a rather wonderful place to come from, you know? Cause yeah, yeah. If you come from failure, there's only one way up, isn't there? It's success, you know? If you come from success, you can go down. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, they have this great, this great... Uh, Do you not think we've got overly confident? No, not at all. I mean, I think the last seven years have been terrible, actually. They've been dreadful, you know. They've been really uh, psychically kind of, kind of crippling for if there is such a thing as a national psyche, you know. I think that the Irish public have been beaten from every different side, you know what I mean? And they didn't deserve what they got, and they didn't deserve what they had to eat, really, you know. Mm. But uh, that's a different question, you know. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. I don't want to be negative here, but... Um, it's, look, it's for, for somebody, every kid I meet nowadays, they want to work in music, they're going to a writing course, sure. they're going to a film course, yeah, you know. And I keep saying to them, dear people, there won't be the jobs out there for you, you know, but, you know, I love the instincts, you know, and I love the kind of, I love the lack of care about your future in a strange way, you know what I mean, because... You know, there, there, there won't be that. There won't be those jobs for everybody that's doing all these courses. You know, that that's, that's seems to be to be the case. But, um, you know, we great, we great work anyway. is great work. Yeah, we do it. We do what we do, don't we? I think, you know. But, um, so... Come back to what you were saying at the start about, you know, about the future. You know, and this, you know, it does seem in film and, I mean, television is developing as well in an extraordinary mm. way. I know you've been involved in that. You know, that it is either the huge blockbusters or the tiny, low-budget Well, not in television. No, not, no. In, not in cable television. That's, yeah. the diff that, that's filled out the space that used to be occupied by the kind of film that Mike Lee makes and the kind of film that Ken Loach makes, the kind of film that Martin Scorsese makes. You know? yeah. And it's really, I find that fascinating because when I do think of working in what used to be called film, I go to a company like Netflix or Showtime or HBO or the BBC or something like that, and they are interested in the stuff that they do not know how to monetize, you yeah. know? They're interested in interesting ideas, you know? And that's incredibly refreshing. And I think that's where the future is for what we do, you know? Right. A 20-hour movie for Netflix that probably will be shown all around the world at the same time and be able to access by everybody in the remote chance that they're interested in <laughs> do you know what I mean? But that is the future, and that is a, a remarkably kind of challenging and exciting future, you know? I mean, who says a movie should be 90 minutes to two hours, you know? The fact that it could be 30 or 40 hours is an amazing thought, you know? So sure, yep. we live in a great, I, th I think we, you know, the, the changes are kind of, they're like body blows, but the possibilities are actually really invigorating at the same time, yeah. I think, you know? No, I agree, I agree, I thought. It's good to end on a hopeful note. I think I can smell uh, lunch wafting through, so thank you, Neil, thank you all. Are we done? Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.